Okay. Um, so yes, welcome to our um, December meeting of the Metropolitan Study Group of the SRIA. This is the closest uh, meeting to the midwinter solstice. And um, as such, I have no doubt that there will be uh, a very um, wonderful, strong influence uh, that, that can flow through our conversation, uh, particularly post the, uh, the presentation from Frater SEC. And um, before we begin, what I'd like us all to do, please, is uh, I want to uh, light this candle. And what I'd like everybody to do is just for a moment is to, in silence, just focus on the, the flame emitted from this candle whilst I say a short prayer, please. This I now do. In the name of Almighty God, bless this our humble meeting. Assist us, guide our thoughts with a light of wisdom. Temper our emotions with the balm of understanding. And inspire us so that we might help each other in exploring the great mysteries of life. May we come together in peace, where physical distance matters nothing. Because at this moment, we are all joined together as one spiritual body in humble service and surrender in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Master. World without end, amen. Thank you very much for our trees and friends. I'm just gonna pop the candle down to the side here. And it gives me great pleasure to hand over to a very dear Dear Frater, um, Frater SEC, and um, I would like you to introduce your uh, your presentation because I suspect that I will, if I was to attempt to do so, I'm probably going to get the pronunciation of the name very wrong. <laughs> so I'm going to hand over to you. And uh, yeah, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you yeah. very much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I mean, good afternoon because here is after is uh, 35 minutes past 3 p.m. CET. And uh, I simply wanted to thank you for gathering this afternoon to listen to this uh, small, modest, humble lecture that I'm going to produce because I think uh, it's something that is strictly related to to this metropolitan study group. Everything started during one of these sessions. And uh, it could be very strange, but I have to say that I, I wouldn't have written, I wouldn't have been here this afternoon if uh, I, I hadn't listened before um, another lecture given by Frater Stefan Guder in which he explained oh, certain, a certain experience, a life experience, a personal experience he had. And I got courage. I mean, I was supported, I felt supported to, to talk about my personal experience as well. That is strictly connected to the subject we are going to talk uh, this afternoon. So first of all, let me, let me thank you very much, the Metropolitan College, the Director of Studies, Stefan, for his support, and, um, and all of you. So and I wanted to, first of all, to introduce this. Um, I got this, uh, this idea coming out from a conversation that was, was taken a few months ago by Stefan Guder, 
And uh, I said to myself, well, well, something similar happened also to you. And um, it was um, many years ago, and uh, it dates back September 1989. Uh, it's very important to remember, to keep memory, that uh, the year 1989 ended with a collapse of the so-called Berlin Wall and the end of communist regimes in Eastern Europe. Uh, that's very important because one day I was working, I'm a lawyer, first of all, I'm a business lawyer, and I was at the beginning of my career, at the September 89, when I was um, called by my director, company director of this oil and gas company based in Milan. And he said to me, OK, let's come over. It was soon after the, the end of vacation. So to me, it was simply you know, business as usual. I went there, and this man started to say one thing that really struck me you will see now when i when i put on also in um, the few slides i'm going to, to share with you but he said to me mr morini something very important is going to happen this this autumn and, and beginning of the winter uh, because the communism is uh, close to an end and i i mean i was puzzled because that man could have been my grandfather in those days and uh, I listened to him very carefully also because he was the big, big boss. And uh, I, I started thinking at the very beginning, I was taken aback and say, what is this? What, what is speaking about? And the man said to me, okay, what you call communism is gonna be end very soon and uh, within the end of the year. And then he spoke precisely to one communist of the Eastern Bloc country, Romania, and um, he explained to me a story regarding the end of the Romanian regime that was under the Ceausescu, President Ceausescu, he was the, the, uh, the Stalin, still, still Stalinist, that we can say, uh, even in those days, uh, it, the conducador, that is to say the big boss uh, of, of, the, um, of Romania. And he described precisely what would have happened and how uh, and uh, I mean, I was astounded by this. And then I said, okay, you are going to work because the, we need to have new ties with the, the new democratic between brackets regime in Romania. So our company needs to go ahead. And, and we started talking about business. But this was very absolutely, absolutely preliminary to our conversation because it was an effect that I was explaining before at the very beginning of the conversation, that something that happened uh, in my life as if it was um, a sort of synchronicity, that is to say, as if I was an actor in a theater, say, hey, you, look, this is, what, this is going to happen. And then when I was watching the, the so-called Romanian Revolution, December 22nd, 1989, I, I, was, uh, I was on Sky News, I was watching Sky News, it was the very first time that Sky News started. And I, I was saying, now it's going to happen this, now it's going to happen that, et cetera, et cetera. It was like looking at a movie. This is absolutely my experience and remain you know, buried for many, for many years, uh, up to now when I, when, I, when I listened to Stefan. So I got the courage to say, okay, let's talk about my story. This story, this is the, the, the preliminary. This story starts and it's connected to the character I'm going to introduce to you, who is a Romanian. Uh, he was a great uh, philosopher and historian of religion. And maybe uh, we, we can say the hair of the work of Nietzsche Eliade. Uh, the man uh, is Johann Petru Culiano. Uh, Culiano uh, is a, a character that lived uh, for many years and escaped uh, from communism when he was very young and uh, he defected when he was in Italy. So I'm going to, to, to introduce this, this character because we are not supposed to know everything about this subject, but it's very interesting because he's strongly related as a character, as a philosopher, as an historical religion to our studies is something I strongly ask you even to study, to, to, to be informed, because he is broadening our conversation, which is uh, the main goal, I think, of, of a study group. That is to say, helping each other to improve our knowledge, sharing. This is what I 
think is a study group four. But anyway, I'm going to to to. Okay, I, I need to to share the the, the Shane. I, I I need to share the screen. the screen. I, I'll yes. sort that out now. Just give me a moment, yeah. please. Yes, no problem. So. But in few words, I'm going to show you some slides because it's impossible to report an entire life, although it was a short life, but it's absolutely an incredible life. And go I ahead, put... go ahead, please. May, may I? May yes. I? Okay. It should be okay. fine now. Yes. Now, now you. Yes. Now you can see. I think. Can you see? Uh, can you yes. see? Okay. So uh, the yeah. title of this conversation is "The Incredible Life of Johan Petro Culiano." I will use uh, the, the acronym IPC. And you read, you see, a tale of mystery and imagination. Culiano was found in Po, and uh, I got this idea all of a sudden say, okay, it's, uh, his life is a tale of mystery and imagination. And, uh, and like, I mean, like my life, like your lives, I mean, this is it, but uh, the mystery of life. But this is a story which is very interesting, very complicated of a, not only a biography of a philosopher, you know, is absolutely interesting. Um, I'm going to start. This is um, the remains of, where, of the villa where Culiano was born in Yashi, uh, which is the eastern part of Romania, closing to Moldova, what we call today the Republic of Moldova. And um, he was born January the 5th, uh, 1950, um, Capricorn. Uh, sharing the same the same birthday with Umberto Eco. <laughs> this is for Stefan. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, he, he had this is something that they they met when they were adult, you know, in adult life when he was in Chicago. But um, this is what they share, which is of course nothing happens by chance. Anyway, Culiano was born in Yashi, Romania, into an intellectual family both on the, on the mother and the father's side, uh, the Culiano, Culiano family was uh, very well known. Uh, they were uh, among the ones uh, who uh, founded um, the University of Yashi and they taught some of the ancestors, even taught in that university. So he was born in 1950, that is to say, probably the bleakest moment in Eastern Europe because there was still, to, still very strong the influence of communist Stalinism. Uh, basically, communism arrived in different ways, in different stories, in all the so European Eastern countries in a very different way, but it was a Stalinist uh, uh, version of, of communism. And um, in, in Romania, this was very, very, very tough moment very bleak days, also because it's a country that before the war, even before the war, did not add a proper, a proper, a proper uh, democratic regime at all. So this is something that must be, must be clearly, clearly uh, understood as a background. It's impossible to compare, suppose, with Czechoslovakia, for instance. Uh, and uh, Romania was... Uh, a very, very close, secluded corner, and um, with a tiny, um, tiny elite of intellectuals and a vast part of poor people that live in the countryside. This is more or less what was when the communists arrived. So the environment in which uh, uh, Culiano grew up was very close. Uh, both in the family, because the family was under great repressions because they were intellectuals and they were not communists. Uh, his, father, his father died when he was 60 uh, of poor because he suffered poor health and uh, a complete sense of being uh, crippled by the regime. This was an effect that was caused of all the elites in former communist regime. This must be taught especially to young generation, what is the complete lack of freedom. And um, the family, of course, uh, um, was close on itself. And uh, he lived only with his family members in a very, 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 this villa, of course, where he had um, the, the capacity and the possibility to read, uh, since he was very young, a huge scientific uh, and literary library. Why? 
because um, the Culliano family is, um, is formed by uh, a part of, of scientists and a part of um, people studying classics and uh, literature. So he had uh, books in Romanian, in, in French, in German, in Italian, and uh, he could be, uh, he could study uh, in this alternative form because the control was, com was uh, uh, absolutely complete uh, of any access to culture. This is something that was also typical of the socialist regimes, especially in those years. And um, so we don't know, uh, as I said, that the sources of the great esoteric and magic culture that Culliano got in touch since he was uh, very young. He started publishing when he was 15, 16 years old. Still, we living in Yashi. And uh, we don't know, so this background and uh, the environment in Yashi. But the local culture is uh, always polarized uh, in what we say, we, we say with, uh, pardon me for the adjective, an esoteric environment. Okay, so when um, Juliano went to Bucharest uh, in 1967 to attend the university, uh, I think that, this is my opinion, the foundations of this boy, who was 17, 17, 18 years old, were already established. This is something that is, must be kept in mind, uh, that is to say, he was absolutely living in a bowl, like, like in a place, a protected place, in a cradle. And then soon after that, he moved, uh, he moved to, to, to Bucharest for the university. Another important thing, since I'm speaking, I can see from, the, from where you, I mean, you wrote that basically we are all Westerners, you know, people from America and Western Europe. Um, so uh, like, um, um, this is very important to, to, to be introduced. Um, a different spiritual dimension. It means that in Western Europe and, the, and in America, uh, we have uh, now our, our, our own different traditions, which are, again, different from the ones coming from Eastern Europe. Uh, as, you, as you probably heard, um, many problems that are now uh, emerging in the dynamics of, of a, an organism like European Union regarding Eastern countries uh, is part of that. And it's not understood at all uh, in Westerns, in the Western side, uh, more, more, more developed, you know, uh, in, in the, the Western side of Europe. This is something that also must be kept in mind. For my studies, I always, as a business lawyer, I deal with cross-cultural management. And uh, this is so evident to me. So sometimes I stress this, that there is a different spiritual dimension. Um, Culliano, like basically all Romanians, was uh, of Christian Orthodox religion, that is to say, the Orthodox Church of Romania. And um, during, uh, during his childhood, he, he spent, uh, he spent uh, the summer times, as I, I repeat, as a family that was closed on itself in uh, close to a monastery. Also monastery are very different from the concept we may have. They are a center of studies, a center that people can gather in those days, especially because there was a huge repression. They had a, the capacity also to share, to study, to understand. This is not only a religious practice. This is something that must be kept very clearly in mind. So, um, like all the Orthodox, um, uh, he had, uh, since the early age, was taught the prayer of the art, the Ezekiel, and uh, which is a prayer that is practiced by Orthodox monks and nuns, and not only by them, but also by other, by other, by other faithful people. You know, that is uh, something that is as is. Uh, practice the hesychasm. For instance, uh, in other religious tradition, uh, we haven't. In, in, I mean, in Protestant world, of course, it, it's not non-existent, but also in the Catholic world, uh, the hesychasm uh, is, is, is based, I don't say it's forbidden, but is 
it's not practice. This is something that you must know. So to understand that it's a profound, profound, deep, different spiritual dimension. So what happened? The, the point is uh, that during this, this uh, dimension, during this, uh, this uh, experience he had in, uh, in uh, summertime in this uh, monastery, he had the capacity, he had the possibility to open his spiritual side. We don't know this. We don't know what happened basically there and uh, how it happened. But I think that this was part of his, uh, of his um, early life. This must be kept very clearly uh, under the spotlight. So uh, the prayer is called off of the heart because you pray with the heart, which is something that we do not anymore consider this in the Western, in the Western world, for instance. We think about uh, the work of James Hillman, that he, he wrote a book on the heart. James Hillman was a, was a Freemason, and he was one of the few ones who started to say, look, there is this tradition coming from the past, from the Renaissance, uh, regard, and, and uh, even before, regarding the prayer of the heart and the heart that thinks, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This is very important because we think only in a very rational way. This is Cartesianism we had, and uh, that turned completely our world as it is today. So, Culliano, in the end, uh, was not a religious man. As, uh, as, he grew, as he grew up, he never practiced a tradition or revealed religion, not only his Orthodox or any other de Christian denomination, but he was, uh, uh, and, and became one of the, of the greatest historian of religions. That, that's very important because it makes you understand that there is a huge difference between practicing religion, traditional religions, as, uh, as uh, for instance, the, the Christian Orthodox, or studying religions. That's bad. This is an aspect that we must, must be kept in mind. So, but this Orthodox background served him as a frame, as an observer of the Western European society. And the contradictions uh, he, he found out immediately after he settled in, in, in Western Europe, that is to say, especially in Italy, he wrote precisely about these, were very clear to his mind. And uh, we are talking about a man 22, 23, 24 years old. This is very important. Uh, the man was uh, a, a, a prodigious in his uh, studies, but also in his capacity to understand, to filter the reality. In 67, he went, he left the, his uh, Yashi and never came back, basically, to study at the University of Bucharest, the Faculty of Romans and Classical Oriental Languages, with a specialization in Italian. There he studied Roman languages, that is to say even Latin, Greek, Sanskrit, and um, he wrote a thesis um, regarding the, the, the study regarding the Italian Renaissance uh, and magic. So then you start understanding what, what, what would have happened in his life. During his university study, he chose a motto. This is what I wanted to, 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 to say because um, it's also related to Joyce. We spoke about these. Um, and he said, um, silence, exile, cunning. Uh, Stefan Dedalus in Ulysses, and in which he was the same age, more or less, 22 years old, 23 years old, like Stefan Dedalus in James Joyce, Ulysses. And uh, this is basically a program of his life and uh, his entire his, uh, existence uh, would have been affected. Irony of the history by this motto. Again, in my opinion, nothing happens by chance. Then what happened? Um, arriving close to the, to, his, um, to the end of his studies at the university degree, he applied for a first visa to visit Italy for one simple reason he was studying Italian Italian literature, Italian Renaissance, so it was a, an expertise, and by those days, he could write, speak, uh, and uh, 
uh, Italians at an incredible level. I read his, his work in, in written in, in Italian. It's uh, absolutely incredible. Uh, remember that, uh, by the way, Culiano spoke currently eight different languages, French, Italian, English, Dutch, uh, German, and uh, Sanskrit. So many, many other. It was a absolutely uh, astounding and absolutely was very easy for him to, 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 learn, to learn a language. In 71, he tried, but the Romanian state uh, uh, denied. In 72, he, um, he applied again, and, um, and this day, this time, it was granted, and um, because he already finished his studies and went to Perugia, to the University for Foreigners, l'Università per Stranieri of Perugia, Central Italy, to, to study to, to, to sort of certain lectures for, uh, for in Italian. So he went there, and on July the 4th, 1972, I underline July the 4th, uh, it's very important because then when he finally, uh, Giuliano will move uh, in, uh, in uh, the USA, we have to, to understand that he left Romania on July the 4th. And um, he arrived in Perugia, and, and uh, he had this, this scholarship that lasted from July to October 72. And uh, at the end of October, instead of going home, he defected and asked for po political asylum in Italy under the provision of the Geneva Convention of Refugees, 1951. And on December the 13th, 72, Italy granted and recognized uh, to Culiano the status of refugee. So a permit of stay, a permanent permit of stay in Italy. This was the harshest experience in, in Culiano life because this was very, very, very hard times. And um, he was completely, completely alone. He was uh, nearly starving. And um, he, when he was in these um, camps for, for refugees, because he was, of course, sent to these camps, uh, because, uh, I mean, he, 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 this is, this is what is provided by, by the, 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 the Geneva Convention. And um, he even attempted to commit suicide. This is absolutely, absolutely incredible. Still, after he committed, he tried to, to cut his veins, uh, but uh, because of lacking of, uh, sorry, of hot water, as you know, uh, the, the, the blood uh, clogged uh, and uh, he, couldn't, he couldn't fulfill his uh, suicide attempt. Um, then um, the, uh, the Catholic University of Milan uh, finally hired him as university assistant. So they, they give them um, some money and the possibility to study, a possibility to have uh, a home, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is the beginning of his um, journey in the Western world. This is precisely what he wanted, and he wanted to break free. I have to say that this is also connected to my life experience. I met many people, even people of more or less the same age of Culiano, the same generation or my generation, who basically defected and lead uh, uh, coming from Eastern, Eastern Europe to, to, to live in the West. Uh, and I have to say that certain um, characters developed by a reaction that those people had uh, are very similar to the one I found in, in Culiano's life. Anyway, um, Italy was the first place where what was called the, West, the so-called Western world. And it, it has a, a devastating imprinting. And, and um, it, that is to say, I have to, to, to quote this letter Hest himself, uh, is the modern West a true wizard or sorcerer apprentice who mobilizes dark and uncontrollable forces? This is taken a, a part which is absolutely extracted by Eros and Magic in the Renaissance, which is, in my opinion, his masterpiece. But now we start immediately to understand uh, uh, the character of the man who was in the early 20s, 22, 23, 24 years old, uh, 26 when he left Italy. And uh, he immediately described this because, uh, of course, the, his, uh, his benchmark was the Stalinist communist state in Romania, a regime, a communist regime that was described uh, not as a wizard or a social apprentice by a sort of police state.
that is to say, wanted to control everything uh, and the lives uh, of all his citizens. Anyway, he maintained very strong ties uh, with Italy, and this reemerged uh, very often during all his life, until basically a few months before he died. He, he came and go uh, from, from, uh, from, from Italy. Um, in for nearly four years, he got another degree at the Catholic University of Milan uh, in history of religion, so literature, but in history of religion, and uh, with, with a thesis, very interesting, Gnosticism and the West. Again, we start to understand uh, in Jan Culliano what was um, um, uh, his intellectual interest and uh, the, the, what was the subject of study with Professor Ugo Bianchi, who is one of the highest uh, uh, man uh, expertise in regarding Gnosticism. And surely he was his second in his life, of course, his second mentor, uh, or second only to, Misea, to Mircea Eliade. In those, in those years, um, um, Culliano contacted, again, the Romanian philosopher in history of religions, Mircea Eliade. Uh, who, was leading, who was leading and teaching a divinity, divinity uh, school in Chicago. And, uh, but he often came during summer times in Paris. So that's the, probably the first meeting Culliano had with Elia that was in Paris. So uh, it was uh, to a certain extent um, mm, uh, um, difficult to, to succeed and develop his career as a refugee uh, and um, and um, and so um, Culliano made different applications uh, in India as well, for instance, uh, and, in, and in Holland. Groningen University was the first one who tried to appoint as a junior professor, a researcher, and so he moved uh, in the autumn of '76. He went, left Italy, and went to live in Holland. And. Uh, Yes, the Holland is, uh, he spent more or less 10 years there. And um, these are the years where Culliano found the balance, uh, financial and, uh, and the status balance uh, as a man, you know, and working and uh, sustaining himself there. And um, he, these are the years where, in my opinion, he wrote or projected uh, his most important works. In 79, he married with a Romanian lady, met in Holland, and the marriage uh, ended with a divorce when he was already uh, living in America in 87. And uh, by the way, in his studies and research, he succeeded to have a PhD in religious science at the Université de la Sorbonne uh, with uh, the professor Michelin Maslin. And uh, in 1984, he published um, in French because he wrote in different languages. Wrote, he wrote in Italian, in French, and in English. These are his main uh, uh, languages. I think that mm, apart from Romanian, uh, apart from Romania, his mother language, he wrote mainly in uh, in um, in English, in Italian, and French. And uh, his masterpiece, in my opinion, is Eros et la Magie. A la Renaissance, and, and is uh, published in English by the University of, Ch of Chicago in 87, Eros and Magic in the Renaissance. Uh, Culliano was also, by the way, and this is also, we arrived to Eco and to Borghese, um, he was also uh, a fiction writer. Uh, this is something that he started doing at the very beginning when he was a teenager, uh, 15, 16, 17 years old. And um, and he wrote these, these um, um, stories uh, under the great influence of the Argentinian writer Jorge Luis Borges, and um, much more than, than Echo, because Echo, he met Umberto Echo while he was already um, a famous professor, young professor, but he was, um, he was in America, so he met him because of these uh, activities and studies. Uh, on the contrary, Jorge Luis Borges was, uh, 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 had a great influence on, on, on Culliano on these uh, ideas of fiction writer and stories. 
One of these stories, which is absolutely connected to the story I told you at the very beginning of the conversation, is a, a short, a very short story written, um, written between, we don't know precisely, but between 1983, 1986. Um, and it's very important. Uh, the title is Intervenzia Zorobilor in Germania in Romanian, it's written in Romanian, and um, the, the, the in English is published is Intervention of the Zorabs in Germania. Uh, the story describes the fall of a crazy dictator and his crazy wife, provoked by a fake revolution controlled by a foreign power that wanted to maintain its grip on Germania. In the year of 1989, listen, 1989, the story also narrates that among the other things, the first free political election in Germany took place in 1996. This is exactly what happened in Romania. I put in my slide a coincidence. So then you understand perfectly that I didn't know about this story in 1989 when I received uh, this stuff. And I have to say that, first of all, the rational side, of course, uh, uh, if this director told me certain things regarding that country, it meant that this was already decided some time before. Nothing again happens by chance. And uh, it, this could mean that maybe also Giuliano, who was involved as a dissident in his political activities, knew something or a leakage, you know, or many other things, who knows, but this is absolutely incredible. But what is very important in our, in our parliament is this task group is also the concept of synchronicity. Could he, could Culliano uh, foresee the future, for instance? He was very fond in tarots, for instance. He was crazy about this. He was very good in tarots, uh, reading also astro charts. Uh, it, this, is, this could be uh, uh, an explanation that could be acceptable in our, in our study group in this environment, which is our environment that makes a certain kind of studies. I don't know, but I receive the same story. I have to say something more. I was in contact sometimes with certain people he met many years before. When he arrived at the beginning of the 70s, he got in touch with certain people in the institution I met for, for my job, you know, for my, for my activity, years afterwards, that is to say, 89, 90. Again, so I have to say that something, not only from the irrational side, the synchronicity happened, but also from a very rational side happened. I say both, and there is an interaction, in my opinion. There is an interaction, okay? Then, uh, Let's go ahead, we, we, we will uh, continue with this. In 86, uh, uh, Mircea Eliade eventually succeeded to find an opening to the Divinity College in Chicago. And uh, Eliade uh, was uh, very close to his end, to, to, his, to his death, and he understood that he, Juliano was uh, and considered him as his legitimate universal heir of all his works and studies. And um, uh, the USA years, the five years, he came there when he was uh, 36 years old, where the, the last five years of Culliano's life. Um, finally, the American dream came through. This was absolutely something that he really, really liked. He really wanted to go to the, to the Grand West, you know, uh, like many other people I met coming from Eastern Europe. They, they, they have the American dream. Culliano, uh, was delighted, in fact, attracted by the USA. At Divinity School, he met people, and this is for, for his, uh, for his uh, role he, he played there, of course, as a professor. He met the historian Harold Bloom, Saul Bellow, and then he, because of his, of his uh, prestige he, he achieved uh, in America, uh, he got in touch with people like Umberto Eco, Moshe Idel, and uh, the Italian um, esoterist is considered as a philosopher, but I consider himself as a great uh, esoterist, Elemir Zolla. In those years, Culliano progressively formed and shaped 
what could have been the second part of scientific life and career? This is the opinion uh, taken from uh, Moshe Edel, who is a great, uh, a great, a great uh, I think one of the greatest scholar on Kabbalah. And um, we, we don't know because everything ended on, with by, was ended by a gunshot on May the 21st, 1991. Uh, Kuliano wrote and published important works, okay, even a few days before his death. He was considered by Eliade and many scholars at the Divinity Schools as one of the most prom promising talents in religious studies. But again, it's very important, May the 21st, 1991, Culiano uh, was killed at around about one o'clock p.m. in the Genslu by an end, end, end gun shot, very small caliber uh, shot in his head. Uh, it, we are talking about the coroner speaks about 18, 18 inches from the skull. This is to, to understand. Um, the Culiano case, which is absolutely complex, uh, you will understand in a while why, uh, is um, was only, there is only one source, one, one important source, and um, the source is the murder of Professor Culiano, written by Ted Anton. Uh, you will see also the cover, is, is written in, in English. Is, uh, um, is the sole critical studies uh, on um, Culianum's, uh, Culianum's life and assassination. Uh, that is absolutely, um, at, again, a tale of mystery and imagination. Um, again, now I'm, I'm putting uh, this these slide to stress this, that these many extraordinary events will happen in Europe and particularly Romania is uh, the, great, the great link I have with this man. Um, because um, I repeat, um, I was in contact in different times, again, synchronicity, which is not in the future, but also in the past, because in, the, in, a, in a concert that which was absolutely, again, very important to Culiano, Culiano's uh, philosophy ideas was that all the events are happening all together, as if people were unstuck in time. Uh, this is clearly described perfectly, I don't know if you know this, uh, by the, the American novelist, Kurt Vonnegut, in the, the, the novel Slaughterhouse Five. He describes, he describes perfectly what is the, the idea of Juliano regarding this uh, contemporary synchronicity of events that links uh, the future and the past all together and the present, of course. Anyway, um, this was an experience that changed my life. And again, I have to, to, to thank you all, the, the, the study group, the, the studies we do, because I was encouraged to speak about these. Uh, it took me more than 30 years to speak about this. I'm giving everything of me right now. Um, I'm, now I'm thinking with the art, opening my art to your fratres. So, um, and this is precisely, there was no follow up to this conversation I had. It was an unicum, like in a Greek tragedy, when the choir represents the fate, the doom, the main scenario set by the fate, and it is announced to the audience solemnly by the choir. This is it. I realized that things are not what they seem. You can find yourself through the looking glass. Another important thing, you can find yourself through the looking glass. And there are people on the other side who can really make things happen on planetary scale. The 1889 experience was an outlook into a different dimension, even though at the beginning, I did not realize what I experienced and what happened. The link to the Culiano case, a philosophical interest in, in his combinatory representation of history, as if it was a game, his ideas of Renaissance and the destruction of the magic culture of the Renaissance by the movement called, we call it as reform and counter reform. His terrible destiny. Culiano, 
this is very this is a passage very important on the esoteric side was killed in a laboratory while defecating this is the, of course the report of the, the the coroner with all the deep occult meaning implied in that matter Cugliano was one of the greatest studies and he studied also this in in, in uh, when he when he graduated in uh, the uh, Milan Catholic University in Gnosis so in the in his uh, dualism again this is the text uh, written uh, the translation in Italia is the myth of the dualism of western dualism that is to say on gnostic basis not only religious one but also as a system of thought uh, Kabbalah is strictly related to this um, we know that in Kabbalah we can figure out two trees two trees one side on the other side why he was uh, this is something that I spoke with certain friends of mine who are rabbis, so they are studying this deeply. They said, when you, sorry, when, when you're, sorry to say this, but this is very important. When you're defecating, you are in impure, impure territory. This is in the, in certain, in the Jewish systems and the, the, these ideas. So he was shot by someone who knew this perfectly, who knew what he was doing, who knew that May the 21st in the Orthodox calendar is the day of St. Helen and St. Constantine. Mother, Helen is the mother of Constantine. Again, Julianus' mother's name is Helen, and he was deeply attached to her. So this is a signature, a very clear one, related to not only the sephirotic tree, but on the other one, the kilipot tree. This is the point, the occultic side. Solutions, destiny and death, fratres, these are only opinions, free opinions of what I understood. In this slide, you can see at your right, Eros Magic and the mother of Professor Cugliano by Ted Anton is available. I, uh, you, have, you have to read it because also at the end of the book, probably we, when we discuss, we talk also about the last chapter of this book. Uh, but I have to say that there are two different ideas regarding this murder. One is a political state murder. 95% of all the sources I consulted and read, even Kulianus' sister biography states that he is a state mother. This was perpetrated by former security or former Iron Guards, fascist group, etc., etc., uh, working and uh, active in Romania, in Italy, and in the USA. This is the main past opinion. There is a tiny minority of sources not more than 5% of what I read, uh, that which states that this was linked to esoteric motive and would reside in mysterious contexts that Culliano would have had in the world of American sects. In my opinion, the case is and will be a total mystery of imagination. Um, so what to sum up, this is my, and I do not want to, to to give conclusions, uh, I'm simply showing the, the incredible life of, of Culliano, but I wanted to, to say something very important since we are talking, this is a, a small lecture we are having um, in a metro, the Arba Metropolitan Study Group uh, uh, to whom I'm honored to, to be a member, uh, the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Uh, well, I put this word order uh, as described, um, the meaning is the way in which people or things are placed or arranged in relation to each other or in a controlled state. This order is the opposite. The constituted initiatory order is necessary for the development of a collective esoteric project. Juliano lived outside. This is something we know for sure. In my opinion, I'm sure to say that he was out any regular initiatory order. And therefore, he couldn't be controlled. In, every, in any case, 
supported, stimulated, and uh, advised. And this is uh, something that we understand of his life. He was a self-taught, between brackets, Magus. In my opinion, in his vast knowledge, he was a high mind, high cultures, uh, speaking eight languages perfectly, Latin, Greek, Sanskrit. But he was a self-taught man, lacking the necessary disposition of an esoteric principles as exposed according to a determined order. This is very important to me. This is also related to the experience I'm having with the societas Rusi Kruciani in Anglia. You need someone as an order to help you, to support you, to advise you, to guide you. And that come, came to my mind, the idea of the social apprentice uh, described uh, in the poem by Go Goethe, brother Goethe, and um, by brother, <laughs> we know that in fantasia, fantasy by, by, by Walt Disney's, you know, masterpiece, and uh, uh, the episode of the, of the social apprentice uh, with Mickey Mouse, you know, but the way it was also brother. And um, he attempt uh, to, to follow his masters. We don't know who is this masters or masters, but he does not know how to control them like they're the social apprentice because he did not belong to any initiatory order. This is my opinion. It's not a judgment. I don't judge any, anyone. This is something I do because by the way, being a lawyer, <laughs> I'm not a judge. I'm, a, I'm also a partial man. I'm on a side always by the fault, by the fault. So I don't judge him. But this is my experience. It's my work. I'm saying, thank God there are others that can help you. Culture and knowledge is nothing without managing a proper method that is the one provided by a regular constituted order. This is what I I think, and uh, we will remain with these all incredible questions, again, of this tale of mystery and imaginations, because it's very, very, very difficult to understand. Will be the case, so, I don't think so, find the perpetrators, etc. the reasons, uh, it's absolutely, a, again, a tale of mystery and imagination. So that's, that's all for the moment, folks. <laughs> I thank you very much. I thank you very much for your time. I do hope this is my first time I, I'm trying to give a small contribution to this uh, metropolitan study group. And I'm simply, if you want to contact me, you have all my contacts here. Please, you have also the possibility to contact me. There is no problem at all. Thank you very much, Frates, for your for your for your for your support. Thank you. Well, thank you very much as well, Frater SEC. And um, I'm going to open this up to our usual uh, questions. Uh, I would um, I'd like to encourage people, though, please, um, with criticism, be careful, be cautious. Um, Criticism is a wonderful thing when it's uh, uh, coming from the right place. But um, maybe keep the criticisms to oneself. And uh, I welcome any questions or comments or contributions. This is wonderful. Thank you. Uh, if you could, I was just about to say, if you could raise your hand with the little, little icon at the bottom of the screen. But I see we have Brig. Brig, go ahead, please, Brig. Lovely to see you. Uh, uh, thank you, Shine. Mario, wait, what a fascinating um, uh, uh, presentation. I do hope um, uh, you will be uh, um, uh, asked to deliver some more. Um, first of all, I've got um, a, an observation. Uh, and secondly, a question. Um, the observation uh, is probably in line with your theory of why he was possibly uh, killed. Uh, occultism, uh, especially, um, I feel, when it's um, coupled with the ability to prognosticate, um, uh, mm. to foretell um, the future, even in fictional uh, form, could be seen by some as a very dangerous uh, uh, ability. Uh, and of course, 
Uh, it could be that during his um, uh, occult studies, um, he was blessed with a glimpse of what I understand to be the Akashic record, which is probably Frater's know, um, is um, the record of everything that was, everything that is, and the probabilities for the future. So perhaps he was blessed with a glimpse of this, but chose to uh, write it in a fictional um, uh, form. Uh, my question is, who do you think uh, might have raised his awareness about esotericism and, and magic at such a young age, uh, given the fact that uh, um, his father um, uh, died when he was quite young? Oh, yeah, that's, that's a thing. First of all, thank you very much. Uh, your reference is the Akashic memory is absolutely uh, an explanation. I mean, okay. could be an explanation, a reasonable explanation for what happened. Um, well, this is, again, as I said during my presentation, is that the problem uh, of Giuliano that, in my, um, my opinion, what I said to you, what I wrote to you, is that when he was 17, 18 years old, he was already mainly formed. And um, this is something that is uh, absolutely uh, uh, unique and uh, quite amazing to a certain extent, Rick, because I, I, I agree with you. Uh, this is something that struck me by studying and I, especially reviewing his uh, biographies. There are different sources. I try to summarize. This is a summary of a summary of a summary, okay? But I, I, I was struck by the same, the same stuff. You, you got the point. It's absolutely uh, something that he had in his wife. Who knows? But he was absolutely like, like the capability to learn languages. He went to Holland without speaking a word of Dutch. In six months, he started speaking, understanding. This is a fact. Again, um, he was formed, in my opinion, in any case, at the end of his studies at the University of Bucharest, when he was 22 years old, everything was, was done, in my opinion. This is, what, this is my opinion. But I, I absolutely agree with you. I am stunned about this. Yes, the, this is the question, which is an unsolved question. Again, it's a tale of mystery and imagination. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mario. Um, thank you very much, Brig. Um, I'd just like to make a little comment as a possibility that um, somebody like that could well have been divinely inspired uh, and a very old soul, uh, having had many incarnations and been connected with the study of esoteric subjects and the mysteries, uh, maybe for um, numerous incarnations and just was born at that particular time, uh, very um, ripe and ready to receive the influences from a very young age. Um, because uh, I, think, I think a person who excels in anything, really, uh, that there is a degree of kind of divine inspiration, that there's, uh, they're influenced by very high um, spiritual influences. Uh, and that I think that largely comes from uh, the result of many lifetimes of inner work. And sometimes we just happen to be incarnated at a time where, if you like, all of the pieces fall into place and we're just born with a disposition that's uh, um, ripe and ready to receive certain influences. Um, and uh, I think that may have been the, the case. Uh, yes, um, um, again, this is also an explanation from our group, study group, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, of course, uh, without, uh, without getting the, the, the example of, of Mozart, you know, or other genius in music, or I don't know, other hearts, we, you can see you have experience of children, could be three, four years old, they can start playing piano. Why? And this is an example. Uh, without, you know, without getting the, the example of, of Mozart, you know what I mean? Uh, Again, um, people think about different, different um, lives, uh, different perspectives. Uh, I myself am um, concerned to certain things and what I can remember. For instance, I am quite sure that uh, in one, my previous life, this is something that I've, I'm now speaking about myself. So 
I have two experience, two, two idées fixes. Hein? En, en français, c'est l'idée fixe, the fixed idea, you know? One is that I was um, a Jewish woman who died in, a, in Auschwitz or something like that, gassed. In fact, to me, the idea of choking, I, I get mad. It's, it's, a, it's unbelievable the reaction I have. And uh, this is also my, um, um, my closeness and my love for the Jews. I'm very close to them. I love them. And the second one is very funny, especially for those who are from America. Um, I think I, I was, a, I was a, a Confederate soldier. Uh, it's something that is, uh, again, I get mad when I, when, I, when I read and study and I see everything regarding the, the, the American Civil War, but very clearly as a Confederate. It is something that is absolutely astonishing. Uh, if I have to say what I thought and what I think, uh, I basically fought the entire war until the end. That's it. It's a, it is a, a, a complete nonsense. I'm, I'm a 59 years old Italian lawyer uh, saying this. Why? That's the point. But I, I, again, uh, think about uh, regarding the, 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 the Confederacy, you know, well, uh, as if I'm something inside me say, okay, if we have to start, okay, let's start again. This is unbelievable. Why? It makes no sense. That's all. Anyway. Thank you very much, uh, Frater. I'd like to hand over to Benny, please. Benny. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mario, for a very uh, wonderful and interesting and inspiring talk. Uh, it was very, very interesting. And uh, what I was, uh, what what I would like to ask you about is uh, that we dig a little deeper uh, into the uh, the murder of uh, Giuliano, uh, Giuliano, and yes. um, I, I think you mentioned uh, that that uh, that it might be uh, some uh, connect that one might be a connection to the uh, what they call security people, you know, the, the, from the former Stalinist uh, regime, you know. Yeah. But at the same time, you you should uh, you suggest that there was a kind of um, occult um, idea about the way he was murdered. You know, I, I understand that uh, to, to murder someone at, at the toilet or the laboratory is a very uh, humiliating situation to, to, to die, you know, and, and, and that could be a, a, a one idea. But, but um, could, could you, uh, could you uh, tell me what, what you think about the, this? Uh, was there any uh, kind of occult scheme behind it? Who, 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 who could have thought out this kind of um, a death for him for, seen from an awkward point of view. Okay, um, again, um, see, I reported, the, the, the correct word in English is that I simply reported the two theories. Uh, one is that, again, 95% think that it was political driven um, assassination. They also say, by the way, that um, Cuyano was attacked before, he was threatened many times, uh, even the last time he, he came to Italy, was immediately threatened. As, as soon as he arrived in Italy, there were no mobile phones, only fixed phones, et cetera, et cetera. They knew where he was at the hotel. They immediately phoned him, they spoke in Romanian, threatening. Uh, hmm. In the so-called free press, starting from the 90s as well, they defined Culiano as a fecal mind. I, again, remember this adjective, fecal mind. Again, uh, people say those in the supporting the vast majority support even the, the his Giuliano's sister that it was a political and that this was the praxis uh, of securitate uh, that want, they wanted to uh, humiliate people because one thing is sorry being in a toilet and dying for an hour to talk it may happen one thing is to be killed with a very small caliber, okay, uh, shot from 18 um, inches, okay, from his skull. 
with only one shot. Think about that the, the bullet was so small that exit from one of his nose reel, uh, this nose reel. And this is the position. Mm -hmm. That's the point. This is the reconstruction because we know everything because there is the report of the coroners, of course, that, that describe what happened. But it is, uh, in my opinion, if you say, what do you think, Mario? Mario thinks it is impossible to solve. Why? Mm. Because it mustn't be solved. That's probably, I'm Italian, then it, uh, Italians are very skeptical people. Mm. Uh, in English, you say, you have this saying, shit happens. <laughs> this is the English comment. Thank you very much. I, I do not. I do not want to say something else. The occultic side, we don't know. It's clearly related in, in the, if we consider in this dualism studies. Many. Sorry, I have to complete my my answer. Uh, Sephiroth and Kilipot. Think about that. This is the this is the idea I I received from my studies and speaking with people who know who, people absolutely who know much more than me certain mm -hmm. things. That's all. Do you, th I have a question just briefly, um, based on what you just said, uh, do you feel that um, uh, he was actively involved in the, uh, the darker aspects of esotericism? Look, um, I spoke to, I have some friends of mine who are rabbis, who are great scholars. Some of them are literally hair of a great Italian scholar, you know, uh, basically, a personal friend of mine is the, the deputy chief rabbi in the community of Milan, and uh, is the heir of the Rav Laras, Professor Laras, who was a, one of the highest mind Jewry, Jewish studies, you know. So he's a very nice man with a high culture. This is what he suggested to me. Say, look, if something happens in that environment, uh, use your rules. Consider these words, use your jurisdiction. You know what I mean? Uh, sorry, the lawyer, but use, under your rules, what does it mean? So the answer is, uh, if I have to say the truth of shame very clearly, uh, he was involved in my opinion. Why? Read my slides on order. What I said, what I have written on, on the order, the method, the support, the director of studies that must control. This is something he has in common with Giordano Bruno, absolutely the same. He went out of the order, he went out of the method. That was a, because, because people thought, especially regarding Bruno, he, he, he wrote a lot of things regarding Bruno. He made a huge studies um, and um, Culliano wrote um, a comment on the vinculis, which is a, a, um, which is a work by Giordano Bruno, saying certain things that are unbelievable. He connected Giordano Bruno with Marshall McLuhan. Uh, it was a, an eye mind, but it was not, he has no method in that sense. As if, as if I say, uh, Shane, let's do some fireworks for, for the new years, you know, and I start working with this stuff. And then I say, oh, I, I lost the hand or, or one eye. As I'm saying we are at the end of the year. So, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I have no experience in that. That's all. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mario. Uh, Stephen, please, in London. Good to see you, Stephen. And also Ian, sorry, I didn't say hello earlier. Great to see you. And thanks, um, Mario, for a, a, an ultimately mysterious presentation about a, a mysterious person. And I mean, three things I'm just going to say. Firstly, of course, the Metropolitan College has a strong connection with Romania. Um, our, a previous member and celebrant of our college was Prince Carol of Romania, who was a legitimate son of uh, King Carol of Romania. And uh, his, his working of our ceremonies brought in some of that Eastern uh, Orthodox quality that, that, that you, you say. And I mean, for me there, I mean, there were 
two great responses to 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 to, to your slides. Firstly, this the strangeness of some people's lives who work alone and the example i, I mean i sort of uh, came to mind was of of the author jules verne who mm -hmm. an extraordinary uh, a, a amount of um work much of which was seen as predictive of the future um but was isolated work worked worked alone and it was never quite clear where his inspiration came from and he too late in life um was shot um, by his nephew, mm -hmm. a shot aimed at his genitals, a similar gesture. Um, uh, the, uh, his nephew claimed that he'd been instructed to shoot him by people from the future who wanted to avoid the consequences of Jules Verne's work, which is a common plot of science fiction now, but in the late 19th century was completely extraordinary and Jules Verne's family avoided any significant police investigation by having the nephew um, committed to an asylum actually in England where he spent the next 35-40 years of, uh, of his life um, and, and in a sense the, 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 this, this effect of this attempt on his life um, led Verne to focus on his own death and, 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 and the extraordinary memorial that the family um, created in, in, in Amiens of which, which itself is, as you say, somehow the foreseen death of Verne and his memorial uh, points at an extraordinary mystery. The third thing, which I think, I mean, you quote um, influences of Umberto Eco, Borges and um, James Joyce. And, and uh, which uh, Echo and um, Borges, I think, uh, as literary occultists, if I can say so, are extraordinary. And for me, um, I mean, we're often taught to see the world beyond the world we perceive through the creation of an abstraction, be it alchemy or the tarot or Kabbalah. And that structure that abstraction as it were becomes a stained glass mirror that well, stained glass window through which we see and it seems to me that um that the, the sheer literary power and intellect um in a sense what Giuliano did through his writings through his literature created unknowingly an abstraction of the world and, and I entirely agree with you because he wasn't aware of fully what was happening, that which was beyond the world forces both light and dark flooded in. And, and, and in a sense, whereas we can, as it were, withdraw from the laboratory, cool the furnace or um, close a ceremony in a particular way, he he couldn't he, there was no it the doors that he opened for himself these texts were simply un, un, unclosable mm -hmm. uh, and i mean and, and it in, in to, to such an extent that we can influence i mean almost some of those forces that had existed it seems to me from what you said in his early life he unknowingly caused to be manifested in the world around him yes um, that's uh, that's correct I mean, I mean, another example as we're talking that comes to mind in the in the strange world of um, uh, UFO phenomena is where people see men in black. Ah. Yes, as it were, agencies of the state that seem to be pursuing them that that are entirely, as it were, um, if not fictive, but but uh, it's as if the, the, the as you say the. the the drama on the stage is now taking place around us. We've moved into the film or in, into the play and ceased to be the author of, or the playwright of the drama, but are the plaything of that, that playwright or, 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 or author. But yes. fascinating, fascinating paper. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Um, again, um, um, there are 
different views uh, and, and different point of views. Again, uh, the, the, the question saying that uh, uh, he was already prepared to, to, to live that life. Sisi was 17, 18, 20 years old. This is something that is absolutely a key line to understand, in my humble opinion, of what happened. And that is a mystery. It's a mystery. There is part that we, I mean, the rational side, we live in a, in a, in a, in a society, our society, the Western world society, where everything must be measured. Numbers, numbers, statistics, statistics, and numbers. Again, uh, René Guénon explained one century ago that this is the main problem in Western society the absence of any uh, spiritual dimension, metaphysical dimension. And uh, this work, uh, I, this, this short, short lecture, I, is related to, to underline this. You need a method, even when you do, uh, when you are active regarding occultic studies, as you said, even more than in a rational side. Once in one way, in one end. To the other hand, uh, we need to reestablish this uh, metaphysical dimension, in my opinion. This is the, the idea of Genon. And uh, otherwise, otherwise, we risk to, to dissolve everything. Uh, I mean, it's interesting that, that well, uh, it, it's when uh, Alice um, sees the sleeping red king. And uh, she goes to wake him, and the Tweedle brothers just prevent her in time, saying, "You can't wake him up. If he wakes up, we'll disappear in a puff of smoke." Uh, and the idea that sort of we are in a dream of others, or or in a text that exists because it's being read by by others. But in that sense, of course, um, you can lose all bearings, as you say, unless there are fixed points, fixed methods that you can return to. Um, it, 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 I mean, I, I think, as you say, the traditional dangers that our culture in, as he said, terrorists, be it alchemists or um, Kabbalists, um, warn us of are true. Uh, they're not to be treated lightly. and anybody that's full hard enough just to do their own thing uh, off, off, off the cuff um, risks really some very uh, unwelcome outcomes. Well, um, again, as you said, is uh, uh, prevented to, to, to wake you up. Um, it's a collective dream as in Finnegan's Wake. Finnegan's Wake is about a collective dream, probably. It's a family sleep, you know, sleeping. When they close up, they, they, they pub in Irish town and they go upstairs. I live two or three years here in Ireland. So uh, they, they, they close up the pub, they go upstairs and, uh, and they start dreaming all together. It is a collective dream. Uh, Joyce was obsessed with Carol, uh, yes. uh, absolutely. And the concept of the riddle, another important thing that people do not understand, repetition. Which is not the uh, like I mean the traditional om or other technique coming from the extreme, the extreme, the far orient, but is something that we also have is a is a is a riddle. If you if you listen to uh, to the to the tune uh, Finnegan's Wake, the music you know was a traditional music Irish music, is absolutely funny you know da 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 da, da. Uh, and this is it is a is a, is a absolutely burlesque story. Very funny, you know, but it's repeated over and over again. The repetition is the center of this. And uh, in that sense, it's related to a dream. This is unbelievable. Again, the basis of Finnegan's Wake is a, a collective dream, but it is also based uh, on a, another work of a, a great, great, great Italian philosopher from Neapol, Giovanni Battista Vico. Uh, he says, by a commodus vicus, at the very beginning of the Finnegan's Wake, is related to Scienza Nuova, the new science, is the base of this idea yet. There are two masterpieces from Joyce Mind. 
you have Ulysses, it is in the Odyssey and the Iliad, which are turned in modern way. He said, what is the, what is the, 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 the Odyssey on, on uh, June 16th, 19, 1904? And so he describes Ulysses. And then this riddle again is uh, this idea of the Scienza Nuova. What is here? Uh, uh, corso e ricorso storico, historical recourses, you know, that is at the basis of this, but it's a repetition, a continuous repetition. And you see this in the, when in, in this mockery, he continues to ask me using uh, 77 different languages in Finnegan's Wake. It's unbelievable. The entire part written in Italian, for instance, and uh, that are uh, absolutely uh, incredible. You don't understand. This is an example, you know, uh, but again, this is what you say is perfect. It's absolutely fit for this. For this. Um, thank you very much, Stephen. I'd like to uh, hand over to Jay Baquinones, please. So if I'm, excuse me, if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. I should really change that. Thank you very much, brother. So, yeah, thank you for your patience. <laughs> no problem at all. Uh, Molte grazie por la presentazione, fratello. <laughs> I would like to ask you one question. I know you have alluded to the influence of Giordano Bruno towards uh, Culliano. Yeah. Do, do, do you, can you elaborate a little bit more on like who other influences, can you elaborate on who other influences might be uh, involved in, in, the, in the research and development of his work? Uh, yes, uh, uh, okay. Um, Giordano Bruno was, um, Absolutely a key figure um, in his um, in his um, studies, uh, Juliano study. Absolutely yes. In Eros and Magic, you know, you can read the the, the English text. As a, I gave you the Eros and Magic in the Renaissance, uh, 1987, Chicago University Press. And um, in that book, he mentions and speaks about certain words. In particular, one short essay by Giordano Bruno, who is called the Vinculis, uh, which is in English, upon bindings, upon bindings, literally to bind. Um, vinculum is a binding, okay? And that is typical of the, the ceremonial magic practice in the Renaissance. Um, the, the, the few words uh, for Culliano, and I agree with him, uh, Giordano Bruno is not the new man, you know, that breaks up with uh, the tradition. He is the last man of the Renaissance. In fact, when he goes to London, he is invited, but nobody basically understands him. Of course, he was a self-centered man, he was a terrible character, but this is, a, this is of the man, psychology of the man. But uh, the man was completely outside all the other orders he started. He started from his religious order. Then he went to, to, to England. Then he went to Germany. Then he, I mean, everywhere, even, even in Protestant environment, he was ex between brackets, excommunicated and expelled. In the end, why? Why he was killed? Because they said at the end, listen, we are fed up with the guy. I'm sorry, but this is the idea I got, uh, especially in Italy, seen in Masonic studies, as a sort of saint, you know, they have this idea of the saint. And uh, he's a man like me and you, brother. But the point is that they said, okay, stop it. He was literally sold, he was literally sold by a German, um, I think a member of the nobility, Protestant, to this uh, Venetian uh, Earl, you know, by which he said, okay, invite him. He was invited by him. And then he was captured and sent to Rome for eight years, not eight months, eight years. Uh, they try all the way to, 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 to save his life, everywhere, starting from, from 1592 to six, the year 600. And uh, it was a completely different story. But what the bulk of the studies of Giordano Bruno is, again, the huge heritage of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. Consider this, uh, brother, two things. The Middle Ages and the culture, which was stored in, uh, in Naples. Naples was in, probably during the Middle Ages was the, the second largest town in Europe. Consider this. 
uh, it was a epicenter of great studies. Uh, they had huge libraries, and he had access to. He was a he was a he was a friar, so Dominican friar. So he had access. He read also the so-called forbidden books. This is very important, and uh, he used his Ars Memoriae. You say Ars Memoriae. That is still today very, very deep in vogue in English Freemasonry. Well, this is one of the first things when I when I joined the United Kingdom of Germany, say, wow, they did they do study this still today. Wow, it's something we don't we don't, we don't can even imagine in Italy. I'm talking about Freemasonry. Now it, so, this is the environment. Are you referring and, to the uh, Ars, are you referring to the Ars Notoria? Yes, not only this, but also Ars Memoriae. The art of memory, which is not the art, because we translate um, uh, the, the word ars is written in English uh, in art, and also in Italian we say arte, and this this is this is uh, this is wrong. It's a technique. Sorry, you have to understand that this Latin word means technique. I I made certain things that I'm going to 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 write something, but this is very complicated. I have to go to Rome and. To, to read again, but this is another story. I will I will explain to to Shane the another crazy idea. But anyway, ours means technique, so it's a technique of memory to memorize and to express this. Another word you see also in all the esoteric studies, alchemists they use the word theatrum. Have you ever noticed that you you see this Latin word theatrum, theater? We, we translate this word as a theater, which is not true. It's a, we can say, motion picture, to make you understand. A motion picture, something that is that has motion. This is it. And in English, we can play with the word um, motion, locomotion, and commotion. Consider this. Very interesting. But anyway, uh, Giordano Bruno was uh, the end of an era for Culliano. The, the, the answer is very simple. Uh, Giordano Bruno was the end of an era, that is to say the Renaissance magic, started with Marsilio Ficina. Last summer, I saw certain things in Ferrara that are unbelievable. I went to, to a palace and I said, at the end, literally, when I, when I get off of this, this palace and I said, okay, uh, this was, uh, middle of 15th century, and they said, people speak about there was the Inquisition, the church everywhere. I say, well, they were there. Ah, they, they said to me, the, 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 the tourist guide said, look, uh, there was the bishop that was uh, simply benedicting and saying that was a magnificent work of art. It was the Picatrix portrait in this building. There was a bishop said, great work of art. This is to make you understand that what we have as history, brother, it is something that is false. It's completely different. If you go deep, simply scratch, look, you, you simply scratch. If you scratch, you see that there is something else underneath. And this is our, our, our job. Thank you. Certo, certo. Uh, if I may offer just a um, little bit of a theory, I guess other so brothers offer their theories uh, along with a family story. Uh, my family has always been involved in occult studies. And as a result, we get to sometimes see things and know things that makes people uncomfortable. Mm. Even if it doesn't have to be the government, it can be just your next door neighbor when all of a sudden you become aware of something that the next door neighbor doesn't want you to know it makes them extremely uncomfortable and as a result sometimes they want to retaliate by either burning us alive or kicking us out of their town or you know <laughs> the old jewish tradition of having to move from one place to another because we just make basically people uncomfortable because when we open our mouths and so I find that it's admirable that Culliano uh, was able to help people because there have been many masters who never opened their mouths, whose writings basically fade into obscurity 
whose works basically are only reserved either for their family or they just basically disappear or get burned. So, I, he, you know, the fact that he exposed himself a little bit might have been the, uh, the, the design for his own demise. Yes, this could be also, this could be also an interpretation with no problem, with no doubt, absolutely. Um, yes, uh, this could be, this could be, could be also a, a way of, of, uh, of a, a way of the, to interpret the, the entire story. Definitely, yes, it's acceptable to me. Um, I'd just like to comment. I think uh, I'd like to thank you first for, for sharing with us uh, your experience of your, your upbringing and your environment and the challenges that it brings. Uh, um, because of your particular uh, way of relating to the spiritual life. Uh, and if that doesn't conform to your neighbours, uh, particularly in uh, certain, certain regions where um, orthodox religion is uh, so um, deeply ingrained in society and opinions, um, uh, thank, thank you for sharing that. I think it's a great shame uh, those people who are who would purport to be the most religious or, or, or God-fearing are very often the ones who are the quickest to condemn others if, if they, their experience of uh, spirit is different. Correct. That's the point. Mm. This is the point. Well, well this is not only, only applicable to religious uh, organizations. Mm. I mean, if you ever heard of the story of Michael McMonagall, who was... Um, was paid by the FBI and the CIA to learn how to remote view mm. this uh, a documented government, you know, history of documents, mm. which the FBI is basically paying him to remote view. And he started to become so accurate mm. that they had to kill his program because they didn't want him to know some of the things that they don't want him to know. <laughs> So it had nothing to do with the religious or even a cultural or cultural aspects. It had to do basically with uh, national security, in you know, quotes. But it had to do basically as like we don't want them to see our shady stuff. And isn't that still the case today more than ever? <laughs> um, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to hand over to Glenn and also Glenn. Thank you for your patience. Um, I do want to say, Brother Mario, thank you so much for doing this for us. Uh, you actually opened up some new avenues of research for myself. Uh, my question, though, is uh, what effect do you think his very early training may have had? I used to be a, a monk of the Russian Orthodox Church. Um, and the Hesychist tradition has a lot more to it than just, you know, prayer of the heart and this kind of thing. There is breathing techniques, movement techniques, sound techniques, its effect on the body, much like Melander, Kerning, uh, some of the old German pan Um I'm curious if perhaps his younger life in uh, his Moldavan monastery that you spoke of. I'm, I'm wondering how much that may have opened up his gates to be able to see a greater depth. Um, yes, Glenn, uh, thank you. Again, um, again, this is something that struck many other, many other, many other people this afternoon. And uh, in my humble opinion, the only thing we know that I, uh, I mean, found out is that he lived uh, in a very high level intellectual family. This is the starting point. He lived also in a, a sort of a large family because there was also the, the sister of the father. Uh, there were other people of the family living all together, protecting themselves in that villa I showed in the picture. Um, since they were completely dispossessed and they were uh, living by their own. This is the first thing, an island. And then they lived in another island, 
which was uh, an Orthodox, uh, Romanian Orthodox uh, monastery, which, as you mentioned, uh, is a center in which you do not only practice uh, religion and uh, you do not live only under a religious order, okay, but it's also a culture between brackets we use in a very secularized word, a cultural center. As you said, it's not the, the exicasm is an example, but it's a way also to move sounds, chanting, uh, music, etc., etc., etc. Why? Because the Orthodox tradition, in my opinion, uh, is uh, um, strictly related to the to the East. I mean, uh, everything comes from the Middle East. I mean, Jesus was a rabbi who was considered the Messiah by his disciples, which is under the Jewish principle, absolutely normal and right. This, this is something that, that can be, I mean, accepted. And then this new sect uh, uh, expanded. I give an example. Um, in, uh, in Arabic, uh, uh, the word Christian is uh, uh, Nazarene, you know, uh, they don't use Christian. Uh, Christianity appears uh, in, um, as a first, first, first word, in a police report. This is, this is the West. Look, this is the, the Western system. Uh, we have a Roman police report, which was filed around the year 114, 116 from what is modern Northern Turkey. And uh, in this uh, police report, there was written what happened. Romans were absolutely terrible in that sense, you know, uh, they were absolutely strict. And, uh, and they wrote what happened. They said, last Friday night, there was another riot outside the local synagogue. This is what is written. And because the local, the local, the local uh, Jews um, did not want that other Jews coming from outside, defining themselves Christianus or Christianus, wanted to introduce and pray in the synagogue. So they stay all together, we're all Jews basically. And uh, uh, the Romans who were very tolerant with all the people except the Jews, because this is another fact, you know. And uh, they filed this report because police had to come there. There was a riot and they have to, to stay there. So consider this, we consider ourselves Christians and, and this definition comes from the very first time from a police report. This is the West, it is the West. Sorry, you are all basically all Westerners. <laughs> this is the West. I'm sorry, but this is the fact. Um, one of the ideas that I've had um, Puliano came from a very intellectual family, and usually heavy intellect sort of stifles the heart. But early on in his age, in his, age, in his experience with uh, a body of techniques, the Hesychus tradition, which do not rely so much on the intellect, but on the heart and awakening the heart. So it's a balancing or a technique to balance the intellect with the heart. Mm. Uh, reminiscent of uh, Louis Claude de Saint Martin in his way of the heart. Yes. Um, I, I think that may have been the intellectual backing, and then all of a sudden, tradition, uh, an ancient tradition of awakening the heart and the feeling, help him balance so that he could see more correctly into, you know, deeper realms than the normal human being. That was my uh, thought. Yeah, Glenn, Glenn, thank you very much because it says something very important. Uh, just said something very important. Uh, the, uh, the balance between heart and mind and, and brain and heart, you know, the organs, uh, this was uh, uh, balanced uh, uh, during uh, all the, the, the Renaissance. And this is the reason, the connection that Juliano understood. Uh, he had the means, uh, he had the means, we haven't to understand what was. And, and again, everything came uh, after the fall of Constantinople in 1453 and before. There are plenty of, of things that are to be studied. And, uh, and uh, I mean, this is not the place, but 
uh, Glenn, again, uh, the balance between heart and mind was very clear in the uh, Renaissance, until the Renaissance. Then there was the breakup. And Julianos writes this very clearly, you, 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 especially those who have uh, um, probably more a, Protestant, Christ, a Christian Protestant background must read uh, Eros and Magic. And uh, what is uh, my idea is, uh, is uh, I think I said once, uh, uh, is that the manifestos are a summary, that is to say, a sort of recording of a moment that went, went lost, got lost during, during and then Culliano helped me in this, uh, that got lost during the reform and counter reform, which destroyed the Renaissance. And the manifesto says, wait, this is what it was, and ex explaining what it was. It's a, it's a relic of the past, it's a summary. It is a summary. Then, um, uh, one of we, my, one of, oh, sorry. Yeah, one, one, of, one thing, one thing. Um, and uh, Culliano says that the reform and the counter reform, one destroyed the system of imaginary and image. Mm -hmm. Uh, counter reform forbade to see the image. Mm -hmm. So they say they simply find a way to hide. Okay, this is, this is forbidden. It's only for few ones. So it, you get the same situation. People are deprived of the capacity to imagine. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. a monopoly, the established monopolies of imagery. And this is this is absolutely terrible. Mm -hmm. Again, because um, this is they lost the balance, correct? Glenn. Again, correct. It's a, you're absolutely great. The balance between heart and mind. One of my arguments has been that we have a document called the Fama. Most of you are familiar with about a story about a kid named. We don't know his name. His name was not Christian Rosenkreutz. Mm. Christian Rosenkreutz was a fictional character in an alchemic story. CRC was a, a young boy who ended up going to university in Damkar or Damar. But when, we, when I look back at the history of the area, some of the teachers at that university were Zoroastrian, Sabaean, Eastern Orthodox Christians, mm. as well as a heavy uh, Sufi influence. Uh, I can't remember the, 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 the man's name, but... Al-Kindi. Al-Kindi. Yeah. Al-Kindi. Um, Al-Kindi, yes. Well, Al-Kindi, but somebody else yeah. that was really yeah. heavy down in, in Yemen. But I firmly believe that what CRC brought back from his time there was Eastern Orthodox Christianity. Mm -hmm. The appellation of in God we are born, in Christ we die, we are revived by the Holy Spirit. Yes. That is the essence of the Hesychast tradition. Yes, yes, correct, absolutely correct. And it's something that the West has lost. So that's so, why I give such an importance to looking at to the Eastern form of Christianity as a very heavy root. Yes, absolutely correct. Yes, it is, I agree with you. Again, it's a summary, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, thanks, I, I, thanks for I, letting me spout. So. It's, it's great. Thank you very much, Glenn. Um, I'd like to comment as well on um, this, uh, some of the subjects that you were discussing then, um, particularly with regard to uh, certain practices involving sound and um, uh, physical movement practices and breathing and so on. Um, I, I've been a practitioner of Qigong, which is Chinese therapeutic mm. exercise and meditation for, for 38 years or so now. And um, I, I, I hold the, the, um, a particular kind of speculative theory that um, people like Maylander uh, may well, and also um, Franz Anton Mesmer as well, uh, may well have um, 
encountered the practice of Qigong and the cultivation of Qi based upon uh, mm. new, numerous different styles and methodologies and technique, as you were talking about uh, technique earlier. Um, and uh, that, that's sometimes related as an art, but it is absolutely a technique. It's the skilled use in, of a particular technique. Um, and yeah, I do suspect that some of the, the, the influential people who um, dedicated themselves to the study of not just intellectualizing uh, uh, the mysteries, but feeling, cultivating our capacity to, to feel, to empathize, to connect uh, from the heart. That naturally leads, I, I feel, naturally leads, um, if a person has faith of a spiritual kind, regardless of what particular denomination, and they have those practices um, and techniques that they, they, they train, that after a while, the spiritual or, or religious orientation and the practice of those exercises naturally fuse. Mm -hmm. So their practice will naturally become not just a, a physical practice of technique or certain movements, uh, but those, those become spiritualized uh, and, and that becomes an aspect of how they relate to um, their spiritual life and their connection to the, to the sanctity of all life. Mm -hmm. uh, th thank you for, for allowing me an opportunity to rant as well there. But I, fi I find that very interesting. I would be genuinely interested to hear more about your experiences and what kind of practices though, um, the, the people within the order that you mentioned, uh, Glenn, that you were, uh, when you were a monk, that I would really, I'd be very interested to hear more about that, but maybe now's not the time. We can find a way, maybe. Um, so, Brig, please, over to you. Uh, thank you, Shine. Um, I, I'd like to come back, Mario, if I can, to uh, what Stephen um, uh, identified at one point um, it, when he was um, relating to, um, uh, to methodology uh, when it comes to um, uh, investigating um, any occult practice. Um, to act, it's my understanding that to, to do so solo without some type of um, uh, spiritual guide, be it um, uh, earthly or otherwise, um, when one is awakening areas of um, uh, 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 the spirit, uh, you can have a very, very bumpy ride. And without technique, without methodology, without um, uh, control, it could well be very dangerous. But I, I want to come back to um, uh, something, Mario, you, you mentioned very early in your presentation when you um, uh, stated, and I think this is uh, priceless, the practice of religion is very different to the study of it. And exactly so, um, uh, having studied um, uh, religion at a uh, uh, university um, uh, where uh, esotericism was not taught, it's when one starts delving um, underneath uh, everything that purports to be what is, and one suddenly comes to the realisation that all is not as it seems. Uh, then one can get in a muddle if one hasn't got an authority, a methodology, a, a, a guide uh, to develop one's intuition or inner tutor. What would you have to say about that? Uh, again, I, I said, uh, I mean, I sent you, I showed the, the, the slide regarding the definition of the word order. Um, it's um, in, it is it is absolutely everyday everyday uh, meaning you know that the one you say when you put in order you know your your stuff for instance uh, it is absolutely that in my, in my opinion you need in any case someone who can help you uh, a study group is a way that you again you have a director of studies that is to say the director directs the study group then you have a group 
of other people that they are giving their own uh, their own opinions, their own papers, and then we discuss and we help each other like we are doing right now. This is what I mean, Greg. Precisely. Otherwise, as you said, it could be very dangerous. And this, the case of Culiano case, is, in my humble opinion, a good, very good example. A very good example. Wise counsel. Thank you, Mario. Thank you. Thank you to you, Brig. Laurentiu, please. Laurentiu. Uh, Over to good you. Evening. Good evening. Um, I, um, I appreciate a lot uh, the presentation and may I introduce very, very short myself. I'm a composer, professional composer from Romania. I graduated in Music University and uh, a master degree in anthropology of sacred spaces in um, Architecture University, both in Romania. Uh, I would uh, like to, uh, to confess, uh, we all had uh, professors for composition. Each of us were direct, directed to one of the professors and we had a very, very strong intimate connection. And uh, it was a problem if the designated professor wasn't the one we have to, to work with. And we have to find our professor. Sometimes it wasn't the official one. I've been very lucky, so I find the one. So in this opinion, I guess uh, Ioan Petrukulianu had a spiritual guide to find somebody or somebody found him. And I guess I wouldn't say it's for sure. Only God is sure. But I guess it was sort of a, a spiritual guide. And about uh, the church, of course, uh, what Rick said about the uh, difference between learning, reading about uh, religion and practicing, it's exactly like that. And uh, there is a big difference between um, the Russian Orthodox Church and the Romanian Orthodox Church. Of course, you know very well this. In Romania, we are sort of um, weird people because um, the language, we have a Latin language as a religion, about 86, 87%. We are Christian Orthodox, Eastern. But uh, the influence is not from the Russian Orthodox Church, but from Byzantine. The song from uh, monasteries is a Celtic one, very, very, uh, um, very, very well influenced by um, the Celtic music, the Levantine. The music from um, Jewish heritage. Um, this year, after 12 years, I um, completed um, a composition. It was the first uh, ever composition from Shir Hashirim, Song of Songs, on a um, complete Hebrew text. And I had a word with uh, this text. Um, I uh, learned a lot from uh, the um, synagogal chants. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a big connection between uh, the Byzantine, the Psaltic music, and the synagogue one. The roots are Jewish. And uh, it's a difference because uh, the Russian Orthodox Church, the song, are harmonic on voices. It's a choir. In yes. Romanian, it's something totally different. It's uh, very similar to the Greek ones. And that's it. Um, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate a lot. Thank Lorenzo, you. Lorenzo, Lorenzo, uh, listen, um, 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 uh, Romanians were Christian by the end, uh, were all mainly Christian by the end of the fourth century. Uh, Russians were somewhere in the steppe, you know, uh, and they became Christian in the, around the 10th century, first of all. So, six centuries before, this is something that he was stressed by Juliano and all the others, like Mircelli, et etc. Et this is this is something that is absolutely clear. Then, the proximity of Greek, Greece, and Greek tradition, you know, especially the Byzantine, Costa de Ponitonian uh, mm -hmm. traditions are very clear because Romania, that is to say, in those days, uh, was Dacia remained part of the Eastern Roman Empire. 
under the influence of the Byzantine. And this is the reason why you have a, a Christian Orthodox Church. This is, the, this is the main point. But again, it's completely different. Regarding Yashi, you know that mm -hmm. there was a great and very important Jewish community there. Absolutely. And yes, and you know that the Israel, Israel anthem was written in Yashi. The words were written by Jews from Yashi. And the mm -hmm. music is uh, the so-called La Mantovana, you know, the, 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 the tune regarding the, the Israel anthem is uh, coming even okay. from that, that area, okay? It was an imperial area. Mm -hmm. dating back, uh, again, the Renaissance that moved to, to Eastern words and arrived in Romania. This is something very, very interesting, as you, as you see. When you listen to the Israel, Israel National Anthem. I know. Yeah, I know. Of, course, of course I know, Lorenzo. <laughs> <laughs> this is the reason why I'm speaking to you. You know, yes, what, uh, you only know perfectly what I mean. <laughs> yes, it's uh, Hatikva, and it's, uh, it's assumed to be um, a national uh, popular song. Yeah, it's a madrigal. Technically, it's a madrigal. Yeah, it's uh, and uh, they. Uh, I met. Uh, okay, I don't want to say something more because uh, it's not the topic of the of the lecture. So thank you so much. Grazie mille. Thank you, Lorenzo. Okay, over to Benny, please. Uh, I just wanted <clears throat> to make a short remark on um, this um, subject of the order and uh, belonging to uh, a certain uh, spiritual system. And uh, I agree that it, uh, could, it, it, is, it can be of great help for your spiritual development to have this connection with other brothers uh, who work uh, with their um, uh, uh, development, spiritual development. But I think also one should um, be aware that uh, belonging to, uh, you know, uh, organized religion, or uh, certain uh, states uh, or, or organizations uh, can be a very heavy limitation for your spiritual development that you're getting conditioned by the organization and you are uh, well uh, you, your, your uh, spiritual growth is, is uh, kind of um, uh, uh, limited by, by being a, a member of such a community. What do you think about that Maya? Well, uh, I mean, uh, again, um, this is not, uh, this is uh, our, our, our societies, as the Rosicruciana is open by default. So it's made precisely to develop new ideas and being open to the world. And uh, uh, Freemasonry and, uh, is not a religion, uh, where well, religions no. are religions. This is, this is the, they are completely, uh, in my opinion, it's absolutely, there is no problem in this, and there are two things completely different. And you, you must live the, the way you want, you know? This is, this is, this is what I think. Must be Thank open, you. being open and not having any prejudice. This is the, this is, this is the most important thing. People are obsessed yeah. with prejudice. Think about the case of migrants, that they are, that we hear every day, uh, terrible things. We are close to Christmas between brackets talking about a, a religious hint, you know? And then you say, okay, let them die in, in, the, in the middle of the sea. This is what they say. This is said today in Europe. I, I mean, we have these tragedies and we know this very well. This is humanity. This is being human. Mm. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Timothy, please, over to you. Yeah, Timothy? I've noticed hey, uh, well. that it, the Romania has been a very interesting topic for me over the years. I have many Romanian friends, and uh, one, one of them brought to my attention was uh, Mihai Eminescu, and mm -hmm. he also... Uh, he also uh, he only lived from 1850 to 1889, so he died very young. He's very involved in the classics. Like um, he has a famous poem called Lu Lucifero or the Morning Star, and 
his attention to detail is is very um it, it really connects when he's doing a study on light and how the light affects uh you know a shaft of light has little dust particles in it and and i was very impressed with his uh connection with truth and uh and uh, authentic experience and i've um he died young and mysterious consequences like mercury poisoning or it could have been syphilis or you know it was it was um very mysterious about how he died so young and it's that that's in the line with synchronicity and also with uh queen maria she was kind of um unorthodox in her religious uh style and she was one of the chosen of um of uh jard and kaus on his council of 12 and so he uh, there's a connection with Romania that's very spiritual, very esoteric, but unruly in that we've made several attempts to establish a high council in Romania, and it's been bogged down by political intrigue. And um, I, I find that, uh, <laughs> that Romania is a very interesting place. Maybe they're more like solo practitioners rather than involving themselves in groups. They're so impassioned when it comes to the esoteric that they kind of like, uh, for instance, uh, Belshantov, uh, he started the Hasidic movement uh, coming out of uh, the um, of Isaac Luria's studies of the Kabbalah. And that's a, a reaction to the light, if you will. And I see that the Romanians, their reaction to the light is a political reaction. <laughs> And that can be that can be deadly. That's but, it, it, but Timothy, I, I've had many Correct. Uh, uh, Timothy, uh, definitely uh, the, your words are perfect. It could be uh, extremely dangerous. Uh, what well, use the adjective political? And um, well, we can it's a, it's a it's a huge story, you know. But if you have contacts in a Romanian uh, background, uh, 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 political movements that that happened in Romania before the Second World War were influenced um, uh, from the esoterism, and uh, this is something again that um, uh, we in Western in Western countries do not understand because we say that there was in Romania there was fascism, which is absolutely something absolutely a nonsense. Uh, the Iron Guards uh, were co a complete different movement uh, with a complete different background uh, of the one, the fascist movements that, that, uh, that was, I mean, that started in Italy. But uh, fascism in Italy, uh, using the correct word, fascism, not in Romania or elsewhere, uh, was a political movement coming from the extreme left of the Socialist Party. They were communists. They were Bolsheviks. In Romania, this was absolutely inconceivable. Inconceivable. It was an esoteric movement that turned into politics. In Germany, Nazism was a political movement with a strong uh, interaction with esoterism. But in Romania, it was an esoteric movement that turned into something else. Keep this in mind again. So when people speak about fascism, well, especially political scientists, uh, uh, I mean, I studied for, for, for a life regarding these, but I have to say that it is a complete nonsense. But again, thank you because you said something very, very correct. In my opinion, very correct. And Eminescu was the birth of Romania. Again, Eminescu is uh, the epicenter of, of certain co consequential ideas. Definitely, yes. Yes. 100% agree. This is the beginning. This is the beginning, Timothy. Thank you very much indeed. Could I ask Stephen now? Stephen Goulder. Yes, I, coming up, picking up on a point that Glenn made when he sort of 
compared the historical character depicted in the farmer with the fictional Christian Rosenkreutz in, in The Chemical Wedding, which kind of points this issue of which is the most important and what conveys truth. Is it an unknown historical character or a known character from literature? Um, because literature can actually drag its own practitioners down. And it's reminded of um, Edgar Allan Poe, whose death in Baltimore, he was found raving, drunken in the streets, dressed in somebody else's clothing. He was never able to re regain his sanity sufficient to, to explain how he arrived in this very bizarre way. And, and in many ways, he, he was consumed by the, the themes he, he, he wrote on. And in Siliani, the interesting thing that Mario pointed out was really in amongst all of his great um, works of history, language, um, religion, it was his fictional science fiction where, where, within which he put his um, anticipation of the future or communication from the future to him. And, and in some ways, um, I think some practitioners, some writers can better encapsulate in a fiction or in, a, in an apparent fiction or work of literature, truths that are much more difficult to convey in a biography or, or, or a life story. I mean, for, for me, in some ways, I don't see that the farmer could have gained its um, longevity other than with the chemical wedding, which is in which is a, which is in a sense um, conveys a narrative that enables mm. perhaps the historical elements of the of the of the farmer to be understood. And similarly, I suppose Kuliani couldn't have explicitly stated in any other way his mm. prediction. So, he, he, which so the, the paradox is it there therefore remains within. Uh, a work of fiction rather than a, a statement of fact <laughs> or of or of science. Yeah. Well, this is the scientific mind. You know that, uh, Stephen. You know that uh, um, that uh, regarding two at least of the manifestos, there are theories that it was uh, Valentina Andreae who wrote the the manifestos. You know, mm. uh, like you said that. It was Bacon writing. He was so busy writing Shakespeare's <laughs> words. You <laughs> said once, uh, I, I kept the note. I mean, poor Shakespeare is always massacred. You know, they said he, 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 he never existed. Someone else wrote for him. He was coming from Italy. I mean, there are plenty of theories of this poor man, but I remember this. And there are ideas regarding at least two of the manifestos were written by Andrea. And um, uh, one very, very interesting thing that they put everything all together is that um, um, uh, Tommaso Campanella, who wrote The City of the Sun in more or less the same period, was in contact with Andreae. So this is another important story regarding uh, the period of reform and counter-reform. So a Lutheran Christian, Andreae, was in touch with a Catholic friar. Interesting. Why? Nobody opposed. He was, he was, uh, he was under protection, Campanella, but he wrote whatever he wanted, met Lutherans. Think about, this is well, a fact, it's an historical fact. So the, the answer is, uh, uh, this is not a mystery or secret, Stefano, or the other fratres. It's something we know. So the answer is, OK, why? I mean, fascinating. I mean, you, Shakespeare, of course, is a great example of yeah. somebody, <laughs> even though there is an enormous amount written of him and uh, history that exists, we see his writing is so profound and mysterious, it couldn't have been written by the person that wrote it. Uh, as it were, it has to have been some, but somebody else. It's, it, it's as you said, Suleyan, it's an absolute mystery where that knowledge came from, even though in the case of Shakespeare, it's... Yes. But, I mean, the, uh, in uh, his, the Prince Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, yeah. who, it's, it's extraordinary that that's set in Denmark by somebody writing in the early, well, late 16th, early 17th, 16th century, 
and it incorporates details of people who were uh, Guldenstein, Rosenkrantz, who were minor nobles in the court in, in them. And yeah, it's extraordinary to think of this, the reach of a man at that time who could form that profound work of so, so we choose to think it can't have been written by him, it was written by somebody unknown who was acting mysteriously, which mm. comes back to your point, I think, Mario, about the sources of knowledge that Culiani had that ultimately are inexplicable. Mm. They are, they, they're, 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 they're hidden. It's just, to some extent, the quality of his writing and his, 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 his insights are there and those are the root in we just have to explore them i think yeah 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 and this is a tale of mystery imagination in that sense i repeat imagination yeah image image imagination image. that's the point anyway, that this is completely lost you know uh, now we have the tiktok consider the now this is my obsession i'm following tiktok <laughs> Yeah, it's very important. Yes. You, oh, no. you should you should be you should be there. I have my nephew. My nephew is 12, 13 years old, and uh, he taught me everything on TikTok. It's uh, another frontier that must be clearly studied by people like us. I look forward to your TikTok um, lecture. <laughs> three minutes. I, I, I mean, I bring my nephew. Say, listen to him. So he will explain to you how it works. <laughs> This is what is start doing this. <laughs> well, um, I'd like to uh, maybe now we've had all of the people with their hands up. Um, they everyone's had an opportunity to comment and ask you questions. Um, there's a post that was put in the chat by our dear Frata Hasu, and I, I would like to um, to maybe uh, highlight this to close the meeting because I thought it was lovely which is you can only convey truth once you discover truth. Right. Thank you very yes. much, Hasu, for that. I think that's very beautiful and very apt. Yes, I, I thank you very much, all of you, uh, and for your time, for your passion. And uh, I wanted to, to say all the best and best wishes for, for, for Christmas and the new year mm. to the, all the members of my my Metropolitan College, Merry Christmas to you all. And uh, I have to say that during one of the last lectures, you, Shane uh, remembered, and I have to say in name on behalf of the SRA, Metropolitan Study Group, regarding what happened to my family during this, uh, this, uh, this year, you know, the spring. And, uh, and I have to say, this is something I greatly appreciated from all of you. Okay, and I convey to the Director of Studies because it's representing our organization and the, the college I belong to. I'm honored to belong to. Thank you Merry very much Merry indeed. Merry Christmas. Um, Thank you. SEC, as you're chosen, choosing to be known today. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I, I'd like to echo what you just said. You know, that we're, we're very blessed to, to, um, to know each other. Uh, in the ways that we've been introduced and the ways that we interact, it's a blessing. You know, um, there's a saying that my teacher has, which is um, that uh, by far the best way to uh, study any particular subject is to be in the company of people of like mind and temperament. And I feel that we're very blessed to have this uh, and the opportunity like this to, uh, to share to question like we are doing with things and to support each other on a human level. Um, so yeah, I, I echo what you said about the Metropolitan College and all of all of the other people, maybe not even connected with uh, Rosicrucianism who've joined us today. Um, as you can see, we're, we're all very passionate souls who, who attend these meetings. Um, and we come from such diverse backgrounds and experiences it's a wonderful melting pot that we have here in these study group meetings. I love this about this, uh, this group. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of love developing, I feel, between us all in these, in these meetings. Um, and long may this uh, continue to develop and grow and blossom and prosper. So I'd like to wish everybody as well a very, very wonderful, peaceful, gentle Christmas. Um, also a happy solstice. 
for the midwinter. Um, but a very Merry Christmas. Uh, be safe, take good care, and I look forward to seeing you all in the new year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vata. Thank you. Bye-bye. So, sorry, my, my silence was only because this was such a wonderful discussion that, you know, I just sat there and it was, it was like the, the being in a heaven that doesn't exist except in your own minds. Very nice, very beautiful discussion. Thank you very much, Hasu. I agree with you completely. Lovely to see you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.